I was talking to you a little while ago. We have already talked about the structure of modern English in our earlier class. I will quickly revise what we did in the earlier class or, or in the earlier classes. Uh, I will also be talking about word stress and intonation through a separate PowerPoint presentation in the course of the lesson today. And then I will continue with our discussion on morphology where we had stopped in the previous class. On the structure of modern English, as you know, begins with Unit 1, which is an introduction to linguistics. We have already learned how the word language is derived from the Latin word lingua, meaning tongue. We also understood how linguistics is the scientific study of language and that it is the study of human speech. In linguistics, we study language, its structure, including grammar, syntax, and Phonetics. The different branches of linguistics that we talked about in the last class are there on your screen. The, I have changed this uh, slide now. It is unit two branches of linguistics. Phonetics, which is the study of speech sounds. Phonology is the study of sounds in a particular language. Morphology is the study of words, word formation. Syntax is the study of structure. Semantics refers to the study of meaning. Pragmatics is also the study of meaning, but it is the study of contextual meaning or meaning in a given context. Slight change. We try to define phonology as a branch of linguistics that deals with the selection and organization of speech sounds. Then we briefly looked at articulatory phonetics, acoustic phonetics, and auditory phonetics when we looked at how phonetics is the study of speech sounds. To produce speech, it is very important that disturbance in air is created by some of our body parts. These body parts could be our vocal cords, lips, tongue, etc. All the body parts that facilitate the production of sound are referred to as speech organs. These speech organs may be divided into three heads, as you can see on your screens. The respiratory system consisting of the lungs, chest muscles, and trachea. The phonatory system uh, consisting of larynx, vocal cords, glottis, and the articulatory system uh, with the pharynx, lips, teeth, the teeth ridge, also called the alveolar ridge, the tongue, the heart palate, and the soft palate. All these things were discussed in the earlier class. We also looked at a diagram to have a better understanding of the speech organs. On the screens now, you see the diagram of the speech organ, the upper lip, the lower lip, the upper teeth, the lower teeth, the tongue, with the ridge on the top, the hard palate and the soft palate, the extreme edge, the pharynx and the larynx. Understand the classification of this and description of sounds in English. I had referred to you I had referred you to some YouTube videos available on our university YouTube channel. IMC Mano. There are three videos uh, on the classification and description of consonant sounds, and there are two videos on the classification and description of vowel sounds. As part of background, in the class earlier, we talked about the English language containing 26 letters of the alphabet, but having 44 sounds. These 44 sounds of the English language may be divided into consonant sounds, which are 24 in number, and there are 20 vowel sounds. The consonant sounds may be studied under three main heads, voicing, place of articulation, manner of articulation. You will find a detailed audio-video lesson on these aspects of the classification and description of consonant sounds in the video lessons uploaded on our university uh, YouTube channel, IMC Manu. On your screen, you see the link to uh, the part one of the lesson. This will lead you to the other links. In my earlier classes, I also played you the videos. What you watch in those videos, briefly, apart from voicing, is the place of articulation. I will just give one or two examples and then I'll move on. In those audio video lessons, you will talk about how both lips 
are used in bilabial consonant sounds. For example, p, b, as in pin and bin, or labiodental consonant sounds, where we use the lower lip and the upper teeth, as in the production of the sound p and v in words like pa, va. Then in those audio video lessons, you will also learn in detail about manner of articulation. On your screen for the class today, there are only two examples, pulses sounds as in t, k, p. These occur only in the initial position as in, as, as in t in take, cut in cut, p in pen. Or the manner of articulation when a nasal sound is produced, as the end sound in words like ring, sing. About the vowel sounds in English, I already told you that there are 20 vowel sounds in English. These may be further subdivided into pure vowels or monophthongs, as they are also called. These are 12 in number, and uh, there are eight diphthongs in the English uh, language, the diphthongs are also referred to as gliding vowels because the tongue glides from one sound to the other sound in the production of these sounds. Like the audio video lessons on the classification and description of consonant sounds, you have, uh, there are two, let me make the correction please. On the classification and description of uh, vowel sounds. There are two videos on the YouTube channel. These are titled Classification and Description of Vowel Sounds. The part one video link is given on your screen. The part one will automatically take you to part two. Uh, as I had played the uh, audio video lesson briefly in the previous class, you know how to access this video and watch it. I expect all of you to go through all the five audio video lessons on the sounds of English available on the YouTube channel. In the last class, we had stopped at morphology. We had already discussed uh, this particular slide, but I will leave it here as an opening discussion to the second half of our discussion on the structure of modern English. But before we go further, you have units in your SLM where after you study uh, phonetics, uh, after you talk about the classification and description of uh, consonant sounds or vowel sounds, uh, you talk about word stress in your SLM. I have moved to a new presentation now, word stress and sentence stress. If you see this on your screen, uh, please type yes in the chat box. Word stress, sentence stress. Is this slide now visible on your screen? I'll quickly look at the chat box. Okay, thank you. It is visible to you, so let me go back to uh, the presentation. This is a presentation on word stress and sentence stress. To understand word stress, remember, it is not easy for Indian speakers of uh, uh, English to know or to uh, gain mastery over word stress because it does not come naturally to us. On the other hand, the speakers, the native speakers of English, uh, use word stress because it comes naturally to them from birth. To understand word stress, we first need to understand what a syllable is. I will not be devoting much time on this presentation and on the presentation on intonation. Uh, I'll quickly go through the slides. These slides will be shared with you most probably today itself uh, by Mr. Siraj. Okay, so I'll quickly go through the slides. Uh, what is a syllable? A syllable, as you can see on your screens, is a group of sounds that are pronounced together. At least one vowel sound will be contained in a syllable. One or more consonants may occur before or after a vowel in a syllable. Uh, we have monosyllabic words in English, meaning words that have only one single syllable. Or there may be polysyllabic words in English where a word is made up of more than one syllable. The word syllable itself is not a monosyllabic word. It is made up of more than one syllable. O-N-E-1. This is a monosyllabic word. Nose. This is a monosyllabic uh, word in English. 
the process of division of a word into syllables is called syllabification. This little chart on your screen will help you to quickly understand uh, the division of a word into uh, different uh, syllables. Different words have different number of syllables. I, cat, log are words in English which have only one syllable. They cannot be divided further. There are some words in English that contain two syllables, meaning you can divide this word into two parts as begin, yourself, woman. Or there are words of three syllables, computer, photograph, afternoon. If you are paying attention to the way I am pronouncing these words, you might have noticed that I pronounce the words under two syllables in two breaths. Begin. First, I utter the sound begin. Your said. Your said. So, if the pronunciation is correct and if we are listening carefully, by pronunciation we can, we can clearly identify the number of syllables in a word. Some words have more than four, have four or more than four syllables. The examples are on the extreme right. Pronunciation, conversation, globalization. An idea of syllables is important, especially when we are writing English and we need to break a line. When a complete word cannot be written on the line and you have to break it, you have to break it at the point of the syllable break. Stress. What happens is that in a given word where you have more than one syllable, one syllable is pronounced more strongly than the rest. Uh, on my system, I do not have an accent mark, so I have used the apostrophe mark to indicate the stress. The stress mark is placed before the syllable. So in the word hotel, which has two syllables, the stress is not on the first syllable. The first syllable is ho, H O. Uh, the second syllable is tel, T E L. When we utter this word, remember for Indian speakers, unless we are trained phoneticians, word stress does not come naturally to us. But then, the second part of the word is stress. In the word examination, the third syllable is stress. E X A is one syllable. M I is syllable two. Any is syllable, syllable 3. This is where the stress occurs. There are some more examples given there. Accident. The stress mark indicates where the uh, stress occurs. First, second or third syllable. Adventure. Aeroplane. Afternoon. Stress. Uh, happens in more than one way. There are changes in stress when the word form changes. Uh, the word, the root word academy is given. Academy, academician, academician. You see the word stress shifting? Politics, political, politician. The word stress has changed as the word form changed. Now sometimes change in stress can be because of change in the grammatical function. There are some words in English which have the same spelling when they're used as noun and when they're used as verb. A common rule in English is that when these words are used as noun, the stress falls on the first syllable. Again, I'm sorry, I do not have the accent mark on my system. So I have used inverted commas to indicate stress. That is not the actual mark. An accent mark is a straight stroke on the syllable. Uh, so, uh, words like absent as noun and absent as verb. The stress shifts from the first to the second. Then the next word that you see on your, on your screen, contrast. Here we pronounce contrast. The first sound with the stress is con, as in the word con man. In the second uh, word, the spelling is the same, but see the pronunciation changes, the stress changes. Now we say contrast. Contrast, contrast. In the second uh, example on the right side of your screen where the word is used as a verb, the pronunciation is no longer con, it is con. The stress has also changed. I will uh, play uh, the sound of uh, this uh, verb for easy understanding. Listen to it.
contrast. If there is some problem, I'm not able to play the sound. Okay, now it's played. Contrast. Contrast. This is as a noun, corn, as in corn man. Now as a verb. Similarly, other examples are given there. Uh, look at the last example, how the sound changes. The spelling is the same, R-E-C-O-R-D. -E when we use it as a noun, we say record, record. When we use it, use it as a verb, it is record, record. Now we move on to sentence stress. This is something that uh, most Indians are familiar with. They also know how to put stress on words in a sentence. Here again, there is uh, no hard and fast rule. There are some exceptions also. Sentence stress is stress on words in a given sentence. In general, the words in a sentence are arranged uh, in uh, are arranged with both words that are stressed as well as unstressed words. In general, we place stress on nouns, main verbs, adjectives, adverbs. The building is painted white slowly. Building is a noun. Painted is the main verb. White is the adjective. Adverb uh, here is slowly. So in this sentence, the stress occurs on building painted white and slowly. There are some words on which, as a rule, we do not put any stress. These are no stress words or unstressed words. In English, we do not put any stress on articles, prepositions, con conjunctions, auxiliary verbs, or personal pronouns. However, depending on the context, these may be stressed. Example I'm giving you uh, on your screen that you see now is the book. Uh, the book is in the bag, not under the table. In this sentence, the uh, words book is book is a noun is is a verb. Bag another noun. Table another noun. The other words the in the not under the are articles prepositions, and we do not use uh, any stress on these words. The book is in the bag, not under the table. So when we speak, the words where we put stress are uh, spoken with a little pause strongly. The other words are spoken very fast. So when a native speaker speaks English, some Indians may find it difficult to follow because that person is following sentence stress in, in English. Give me one second. All right. Now, to look at change of stress within a sentence, depending on what is important in the context. Generally, we said we do not pronounce, uh, we do not put stress on personal pronouns. But look at the first sentence. As a subject, if I want to focus attention on the subject I, then I will stress it, meaning I and not somebody else. I'll go to the market tomorrow. I'll go to the market tomorrow, meaning it is the act of going that is more important. I'll go to the market tomorrow. Market, not to the college, not to school or anywhere else. I'll go to the market tomorrow. Here the stress is on the word tomorrow. When you will go to the market is more important. So depending on the context, depending on the situation, we use uh, sentence stress. Now, if this is clear to you, let me take you to uh, intonation. This is also a unit in your SLM. I'll also quickly go through it. Because the slides are self-descriptory, they are not very difficult to follow. Uh, and these, slides, these presentations will be shared with you. Do you see this slide on what is intonation? Please type yes or no. Uh, a quick question answer. Uh, Salman has a question. If we do not have main verb in sentence, then the stress goes on an auxiliary verb? No. You cannot have a sentence without a main verb. A main verb, that is why it is called the main verb. You cannot have a sentence without the main verb. Auxiliary verb is a helping verb. It may or may not be there in a sentence. 
Okay, you are able to see the uh, screen, so I'm going back. Uh, intonation refers to the use of tone to convey attitude. Uh, as we all know, sentences are basic units uh, of communication, and we do not utter all the words or phrases in a sentence in a monotone. As we speak, our tone increases and falls, falls and increases. As I told you, there are some words that are stressed and some words which are not stressed. What does tone do in intonation? Tone marks the entire sentence to indicate whether it is a question, a statement, an exclamation, a command, a mood, or an attitude. In English, there are four types of uh, in English there are four types of intonation, as you can see on your screen: falling intonation, rising intonation falling rising intonation and rising falling intonation. We look at each of these three types with one very brief example uh, and we'll do this quickly because we have to go back to morphology. In falling intonation, there is a fall in the voice from high to low pitch and it indicates finality. There is nothing else to be added. What are the uses of falling intonation? When do we use falling intonation? We use falling intonation in short, complete sentences that are spoken without any emotion. The room is empty. It is used for WH questions. What, why, where, when, how. These are WH questions. What's your name? From high to low. What's your name? Or it is used for commands. Come here. Rising tone. Rising tone is another type of intonation. Here the pitch increases. It indicates that something is to be added. The uses of rising tone are given there on your screens. While falling tone is used in WH questions, for yes or no questions, we use rising tone. Remember in rising tone, the pitch increases from low to high. Are you coming? It is also used in WH questions but only when used in a very friendly manner. There is a difference in question in the question, what's your name? To how's your brother? You know the person. There is a level of acquaintance here. So uh, for WH question in a friendly manner, you can use the rising tone. For all requests, greeting, leave taking, we use the rising tone. Please sit down. For command, it is falling tone. For, uh, for uh, uh, request, it is rising tone. So a person by listening to your tone can understand whether it is a request or a command. Intonation is very important because it can hurt the feelings of some people. Rising tone is also used in incomplete sentences. I have given an example there, the last uh, bullet point. Uh, the words in bracket indicate that that part has been left out. You wanted to say something after it's 7 o'clock. It's 7 o'clock but you didn't come yet. It's 7 o'clock. She's still not here. So these are incomplete sentences where we are using rising tone. Falling rising intonation. It is the combination, as you can see in the term itself, of a rising tone and a, of a falling tone and a rising tone. It is used to indicate doubt, disinterest, lack of enthusiasm. Suppose your friend invites you to their new flat. You see the flat, you didn't like it much, but you have to give a compliment to your friend. Or your friend has asked, do you like my flat? You actually did not like it. You're disinterested. You're not enthusiastic. You're doubtful whether it is really good or not. So you will say, the flat is nice. From falling to rising. Rising falling is the opposite type. It indicates the opposite, enthusiasm or interest. So from... Uh, rising, it then falls down. With this, we end uh, the discussion on intonation. Let us now go back to our discussion on morphology. Uh, now, I will need you to type in your chat box once again whether you see the slide morphology. I'll come back to the questions later, the question on polyglot and multilingual. Okay. In the last class, one second, please. Last 
class, we looked at uh, morphology. We quickly looked at the uh, free morphemes and the bound morphemes. And I also told you uh, something about infectional morphology or derivational mo morphology, but it was not discussed in great detail. One second. Uh, let me change your slide. Just give me a second. Okay, we, in the last class, uh, we have already looked at what exactly do we mean by morphology. Morphology is the study of words, it is the study of word formations, it is the study of word structure. There are some questions that uh, morphology addresses. Questions like, what is the word? How are words formed? How the words change? How are words related to each other? These are all the questions, the answers for which are looked at under morphology. Uh, a word or a morpheme is a meaningful linguistic unit that can be combined into words to form phrases or sentences. When we study morphology, it is important for us to understand what a morpheme is. A morpheme is a word, but it is the smallest meaningful unit of a word, one which can be combined with other words to form a phrase or a sentence. Uh, next slide. We are looking further into a uh, morpheme, trying to understand what a morpheme is. As I told you, a morpheme cannot be further subdivided. Uh, it is also referred to as a simple word or a stem. A morpheme can be of two types. A free morpheme, as I told you in our earlier class, uh, can exist independently, whereas a bound morpheme is dependent. It cannot exist independently. Example words for free morphine, read, boy. This is a morphine, it is free, it can depend, uh, it can exist on its own, it does not need any other word, any other morphine to complete its meaning. However, in the words like unreadable, boyhood, you have some prefixes and suffixes added. The prefixes and suffixes given in red cannot exist independently unless they are words which have some other meaning. Here, able is used as a suffix. Able could be a word by itself. Hood, here is used as a suffix, like childhood, uh, motherhood, boyhood. Hood also refers to something that you wear on your head. So that hood is a different separate morphine. This hood is different. We talked about how words can be studied as open class words and closed class words. I had discussed this in the earlier class. In our class today, in a previous slide, I talked about free morphemes and I told you how free morphemes uh, could be further studied as open class words and closed class words. This is important. What do we understand by open class words? Open class words are content words. These are full words. Examples, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. These are all open class words. We can borrow and coin new nouns and new words. Closed class words are function words like prepositions, articles, or conjunctions. These are all words with grammatical function. We also in, a, in the previous slide, it referred to the use of affixes in bound morphemes. The affixes are bound morphemes, whether it is a prefix or a suffix. It cannot exist on its own. It is not a free morpheme. It is a bound morpheme. This process of creating new words from existing words in the same language is referred to as affixation. What happens in under affixation? Some changes may happen to the word. The word uh, changes could be in pronunciation, in stress, in spelling, in meaning, or in the part of speech. The later slides will give you more information about this. Let us look at the use of prefix as morphemes. 
prefix as the word indicates and, and as you all very well know is added before a word. Uh, it can be used to make antonyms but not necessarily antonyms. When we use a prefix to make antonyms, some examples are given there in the next four bullet points. With the word responsible, if you add the prefix IR, it becomes irresponsible, making the word responsible, uh, making the word irresponsible an antonym of the word responsible, antonym meaning opposite. Similarly, when the prefix un, un, is added to the word happy, the bound morphine un or un becomes the, uh, makes the word an antonym, happy and happy. Courage, discourage. The antonym of the word courage is formed with the help of a bound morphine, this, d-i-s. Similarly, ability and the antonym inability can be formed by the prefix or the morphine in. Prefixes, again as the word you should all know by now, uh, is added after a word. A suffix comes at the end of a word, prefix comes before the word. A suffix may be used to form plural or it may be used to indicate possession. Some examples of forming plural in English, as you can see on three bullet points uh, on your screen, with the help of adding the suffix s, es, or en. The word girl in the singular form can be transformed into its plural form girls by adding the suffix s, glass, glasses, es is the suffix used and you have the word glasses. Ox, which is the singular form, can be written in its plural form with the help of the suffix en. So ox, oxen. As I said, a suffix s may also be used to indicate position. To indicate possession, we use apostrophe followed by S. The boy is in the car. The boy's car is green. In the second sentence, we are using not the plural form, we are using the possessive form. Ahmed's car, Sarah's home. These are all examples of indicating possession with the help of a suffix apostrophe S. Continuing a discussion on the use of suffix, suffixes may be used to indicate degree of comparison. Take the root word long, L-O-N-G, long. To make the comparative degree of the adjective long, if we add the suffix E-R, it becomes longer. That is the comparative degree of long. Or we can form the superlative degree by adding E-S-T to long. long longer, longest. These are the three degrees of comparison of the adjective long. Positive long, comparative longer, the longest would be the superlative degree. If this is clear, let us move to the understanding of the use of suffix in tenses. ed, ing, en, these are the suffixes added to words to indicate change in tense. The word Pass, past, past tense, pass, passing, indicating the present participle or the continuous form. When I was passing by the river, E and form, as in the past participle, written, write, wrote, written. These are all examples of suffixes used to indicate either a degree, uh, in, indicate degree of comparison or to indicate a change in under morphology, when we study inflectional morphology and derivational morphology, we look at the word structure. Words change the structure by two methods, either by inflection or by derivation. In English, the use of inflection is very limited, but in some Indian languages, there is excessive use of inflection. Word variation or inflection uh, is used to show grammatical contrast or grammatical change. It is used, for example, in the slides that we uh, went through just now. 
the singular and the plural form. This is a grammatical contrast. Girl, girls. This is an example of inflectional morphology where we have used uh, suffixes to change the singular to the plural form. Or the use of possessive or the genitive case, apostrophe S, girls, amas, etc. Or the degrees of comparison, longer, darker, darkest, bright, brighter, brightest. Or in the change of tense, go, going, gone. Some more examples are given there on, on the slide that you see on your screen now. Remember, there are no prefixes in, in, in infection. If at all we use, we have what we use are the suffixes, but we do not use prefixes in inflectional morphology. And in inflectional morphology, the word does not undergo any change in its part of speech. The verb remains the verb despite the inflection. Look at the example word on your screen, work. That is the root word, work. We have added the suffix s. This is to indicate he works, she works. Third person. The past tense is indicated by adding the suffix ed. Continuous form is indicated by adding ing. Verb, 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 working. There is change, but there is no change in the part of speech. The part of speech remains verb. Similarly, clever, cleverer, cleverest, as you can see on your screen. The part of speech is adjective. In the course of the inflectional morphology, there are changes. Uh, it is clever, cleverer. Clever, cleverer, cleverest. There are changes. We have added the inflections, ER, EST, but the part of speech has not changed. It still remains the adjective. Then we move on to derivational morphology. Change in slide. Derivational morphology, two things happen. One, class change. Two, class maintaining. Converting one part of speech to another that happens in derivational morphology is class changing. Changing the meaning of the root is class maintaining. The difference between derivational morphology and inflectional morphology is given in the last two bullet points. Derivational morphology introduces changes in class and in meaning. Inflectional morphology only introduces grammatical changes. Let us look at the class changing aspect of derivational morphology. It describes how new words are derived through prefixes and suffixes. Look at the word happy, which is an adjective, positive adjective. You can convert this into the negative form. It will remain the adjective, but in the negative form, unhappy. But happy can become a noun when you add the suffix ness. So see how the class is changing from an adjective. The part of speech has changed to a noun, happiness. Or it could become an adverb when you add ly. Happy, happily, happiness. Adjective, adverb, noun. So in derivation morphology, you're noticing a change in the part of speech. Some more examples are given there on your screens. A noun as verb. When you add M-E-N-T, it becomes a noun. Quint as an adjective can transform into an adverb when you add the uh, suffix L-Y to it. Summary as a noun can be treated as a verb when you make it summarize. Pain which is a noun form, can be the adjective form when you write famous. So slight changes in the suffixes and you find that there are changes in the part of speech. This table will help you to understand this better. How meaning changes through derivation morphology. Suppose you add the prefix X to the root word minister. Minister, somebody in office. Ex-minister, somebody who is no longer in office. Somebody who was a minister at one point of time. Somebody who is not a minister now. So this is an example of meaning change in derivation morphology. This in un, these prefixes give us the meaning not. 
And if they are added to some words like qualified, disciplined, kind, they give us the complete change in meaning. Qualified, disqualified is the opposite. Discipline, the opposite meaning would be indiscipline. Kind, the opposite meaning cruel would be unkind. Or if you use re meaning again, rewrote, rewrite. So there are, there are changes in meaning that are happening here in derivation morphology. In morphology, as you already know, uh, we study word formation through inflection. We study word formation through derivation. We have already looked at inflection morphology and derivation morphology. Word structure or morphology is also interesting because of compounding or the lexical construction. We look at these in the following slides. Compound, as the word indicates, is the formation of words by joining two or more words together to form a new word. English is a living language. We find more and more words being added to the English language. The existing words are also joined together to form a totally new word. For example, the word fast as an adjective was already present in the, in the English language. The word foot was already present in the English language as a noun. At some point of time, we have a new concept in the world of cuisine, which is fast food. So fast and food have been joined together to form a new word, a compound word. Pat, the body part, cake, which is a verb, are brought together in a new word and treated as handshake. Some other examples are of compounding given on your screen. Uh, as you look at those examples, I'm quickly going back to the chat to see if there is anything important. No. Okay. Coming back to the slide. Son-in-law, father-in-law, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. These are all examples of hyphenated compound words. Vice President, Vice Chancellor, Open Class as I used in one of the slides today. These are all examples of compounding. Other phase of word formation include uh, coining, blending, flipping. In coining, we create a new word, a word that was not originally there in the language is introduced by some person and it becomes a routine word in that language. For some words, I have given the year in which they were first used, allergy, robot, television. Before the given year, these words were not in use. Similarly, with the advent of information technology with the world of computers. There are so many new words in the English language, words which your parents might not have studied when they were in school. Computer, laptop, reboot, these are all newly coined words in the English language. And more and more words keep, coined, uh, keep getting coined in the English language. This makes the study of English language very interesting. A very creative form of making new words with the help of existing words. What is, this is very common in the world of advertising. What happens is that we take the first part of one word, remove the second half, and we remove the first half of the second word, retain the last part. So mortal, which is a full-fledged word in English, and hotel, which is again a full-fledged word in English, may be taken together, remove the last part of motor, retain M-O-T, drop O-R, and from hotel, drop the first half, H-O, retain T-E-L, T T is common to both, and we have a new word, motel, or hotel, where you can drive in with your motor. Motor plus hotel, motel. One other form of uh, new words or word formation is through acronyms. Under acronyms, we form a new word using the first letter of a group of words. Sometimes the first two letters may also be used together to form an acronym. But the acronym is pronounced as one single word. For example, NASA, laser, ISRO. We are not saying NASA. We are not saying LASER. We treat it as a complete word in itself. NASA, laser, ISRO. Indian. Space Research Organization, is ro. We are using, pronouncing it as, as one word. This is the example of 
acronyms in English. After morphology, one important part of your syllabus is syntax. Under syntax, what are the major aspects that we need to study? The parts of speech, like nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives, etc. We also need to study the structure of English sentence. The basic English sentence is formed with subject plus verb or subject plus predicate. I come. This is a sentence. He slept. This is a sentence. Just with subject and verb, we have a sentence. There are some basic sentence patterns in English. Some consider five basic patterns. Some others consider seven basic patterns. Some others may evolve some other pattern of a sentence in English. But whatever it is, these sentence patterns make the learning of English very easy. In some schools, even today, the English language is taught to students with the help of this basic sentence. The students may be given a structure. The teacher writes on the board, subject plus verb plus object, S, V, O. And she gives one example sentence. For example, I ate an apple. I is the subject, ate is the verb, and apple is the object. And she tells the class to write 10 more sentences, 5 more sentences in the same pattern. And the students now change either the pronoun or the verb or the object to make new sentences. It helps students to learn how words are formed in English because the structure of a sentence is very important. You cannot randomly change the components of a sentence. It would become wrong English. So the teacher gives the example, subject plus verb plus object. I ate an apple. And the student may write, he drank some milk. Ahmed wrote a letter. Uh, sorry, uh, Ahmed uh, picked the basket. So on and so forth, the students will go on adding sentences un until a particular pattern is mastered. Then the teacher takes the class to the other pattern. And in general, what teachers do in our classrooms is they gradually increase the complexity of the sentence structure. One other aspect that we need to study under, under syntax are the components of a sentence, the subject, the predicate, the object, and the phrase structure. We will look at these separately as we move on. When we talk about the English sentence, we also have to look at the types of sentences in English. This also will look in the following slides. Sentence structure. I have not given you a detailed description here. I have just given four or five examples only. Uh, later on, maybe in a day or two, through your email, I will be sharing uh, a brief uh, write-up or a brief uh, uh, file on the sentence structure, listing all the structures along with some example sentences. So for now, we look at three or four and move on. Basic sentence structure in English is subject plus verb. She slept. Here, the verb is intransitive. Intransitive verbs do not need an object. Verbs can be divided into two. Intransitive verbs or transitive verbs. Transitive verbs need an object to complete the meaning. They do not stand on their own. Intransitive verbs do not need an object to complete the meaning of the sentence. So in the first example, she slept, there is no need for an object. Just the two words give us complete sense. In the second structure, we have subject plus verb plus object. In the sentence pattern, we are using the subject first. The subject could be a noun or a pronoun in the singular or the plural. Salma bought a car. Here, Salman is the subject. Bought is the verb. A car is the object. The verb bought is transitive. It requires an object. We cannot say Salman bought. If you say Salman bought, the person will ask what. The sentence is not complete. But if you say he slept, she slept, I slept, there won't be any further question. Next pattern, subject plus object plus object. An object in English could be indirect object or a direct object. In the sentence given on your screen, we are using two objects, an indirect object as well as a direct object. 
Salman gave me a book. In this sentence, subject Salman gave verb. What did Salman do? There is some action happening here. Salman gave a book. Book is the direct object. To whom? To somebody. That somebody is me. So you have both a direct object book and an indirect object me. Salman gave me a book. If the teacher gives this as an example to her class and wants the student to, to write more uh, sentences based on this pattern, the student may write something like this. They uh, brought uh, her a new car or they brought her a flower, something like that. And the student will go on learning the sentence pattern. Then we have subject plus verb plus complement. He is happy. In the other example that I've given on your screen, we have subject plus verb plus object plus complement. Ahmed made, made his mother happy. This is the pattern in English, fixed pattern. The pattern needs to be followed. You cannot change the pattern at random. If the pattern is changed, the sentence does not make sense in English. Let me uh, read the sentence. Salman gave me a book. Salman mujhe ek kitab diya. Salman mujhe. Me has come here. There is no verb in Urdu yet. Salman mujhe ek kitab. We have also used the direct object, but we have not used the verb yet. Salman mujhe ek kitab diya. The verb has come at the end. In English, we do not do that. Salma, a book, me gave, this is wrong English. That is why understanding the basic sentence structure in English or the sentence pattern in English is important. Wo khush hai. She is happy. Wo, she, khush, happy hai. Is. But if you follow the Urdu or the Hindi pattern here, the sentence would be wrong. She happy is. We don't say it like that in English. So now you know why the sentence structure or the sentence pattern is important in the English language. We study the sentence pattern or the basic patterns of the English sentence. I have just given you one or three for examples. As the sentence gets lengthier, we use either a noun phrase, a preposition phrase, or an adjective phrase, or an adverb phrase. All these add further meaning to a sentence depending on the context. These are more examples when I share with you the PDF. I will try to share with you a T-diagram also, break a sentence into uh, the phrase structure, show what is the noun phrase in that sentence, is there a prepositional phrase, if there is a prepositional phrase, what is it, etc. So when you look at the T-diagram, you'll find it easy. Otherwise, your SLM also gives many examples on the various uh, phrase structures in English. To know about the components of a sentence, subject, predicate, object, the subject is a noun phrase, it could be a pronoun or a noun, the predicate is the verb phrase, it contains the verb, in English the verb comes be between the subject and the object, unlike in some other languages where the verb comes at the end. Look at the examples on your screen and concentrate on the words given in red font. You eat food, you come here. Tum khana khao. This is a translation of the first sentence. You eat food, tum khana khao. Look where the verb is coming. In English, it is in the middle. It is between the subject and the object. You come here, come in red font. That is the verb coming in between the subject and the object. Look at the... Uh, Urdu version or the Hindi version. Tum yaha ao. The verb is not in the middle. It comes at the end of the sentence. Object could be indirect or direct object as we have looked at some examples a little while earlier. Now let us quickly look at the types of sentences. It is almost time for the class to end. We can study types of sentences either as simple sentence, compound sentence, complex sentence. We can also study the types of sentences as declarative sentence, imperative sentence, exclamatory sentence, and interrogative sentence. Let us look at the first set first. 
Each sentence in English contains a clause. A clause contains a subject and a predicate and it makes sense. A phrase does not make complete sense. A clause makes complete sense. That is the difference between a clause and a phrase. In a simple sentence, there is one single main clause. A main clause is also called an independent clause. It does not depend on any other clause or phrase in the sentence to complete its meaning. In the example sentences that I gave earlier, he slept. It is a simple clause because there is one main clause. There are no two clauses there. Uh, Salman bought a, uh, bought a car. This is again an example of a simple sentence where we have one single main clause, a subject and a predicate that makes complete sense. In the case of a compound sentence, we can have two or more main clauses. Each clause is independent. It does not depend on the other clause to complete its meaning. There is a famous statement about uh, Alexander the Great. He came, he saw, he heard. This is a very good example of a, of a compound sentence. He came, let me write it down for you. Write it down in red font. He came. This is one complete independent clause. There is a subject and a predicate. It does not depend on any other clause to complete its meaning. He came, he saw. This is again one clause. It is independent. It does not depend on he came to complete its meaning. He came, he saw, he conquered. It's again one single main clause. It is independent. It does not depend on any other words, phrases or clauses in the sentence to complete its meaning. So this is an example of a simple, uh, sorry, I typed it in the wrong place. This is the example of a compound sentence. A compound sentence may contain two or more clauses. He came, he saw, he conquered. Then you have an example of a complex sentence where you have one main clause and you also have one or more dependent clauses. The dependent clauses depend on the main clause to complete their meaning. Uh, let me write a sentence to make it easy for you to understand. Again, let me use red font. After an hour. In this sentence, after an hour does not make complete sense. It depends on he came to complete its meaning. So in the sentence he came, we have one main clause, that is he came, and the dependent clause is after an hour. It is dependent on he came, which is the independent clause in that sentence. So he came is the example of a simple sentence. He came, he saw, he conquered is an example of a compound sentence. He came after an hour is an example of a complex sentence. A better example would be he came after I left. Yeah, this is a better example because we have a subject and a predicate here. He came after I left. He came or on its own it can stand. But will after I left stand on its own? Suppose you remove he came. Will after I left complete the meaning? No. There is a subject, there is a predicate, but it does not complete its meaning. It depends on the uh, main clause or the independent clause to complete its meaning. This is an example of a complex sentence. Another way to study sentences in English is to understand them as affirmative or declarative sentences. Or these are also statements. Anything where you are, for example, presenting a fact. I wake up at 4 a.m. This sentence, it is a declarative sentence. It is a simple sentence. It is making a statement. There are certain sentences in, in English where, uh, let me change the font, where you are presenting a command. So sentences that give commands are called imperative sentences in 
English, for example, shut the door. In this sentence, we have the verb and the predicate. The subject here is implied. You shut the door. Okay? So there is a subject very much here, but the subject is implied. It is a command, so it is called an imperative sentence. We also have some sentences in English that are called exclamatory sentences. Exclamatory sentences, as the word indicates, are sentences that are used to express feelings. They are used to exclaim. For example, Hooray, we won the match. Again, the exclamatory sentences end with a question mark. In the case of imperative sentence, it could be an exclamation mark or it could be a full stop. Affirmative or declarative sentence always end with a full stop. A common rule for all English sentences is that a sentence in English begins with a capital letter. In the Indian languages, there is no concept of uppercase and lowercase. So generally, students who come from non-English medium background find it a little difficult to use a capital letter or the uppercase to begin a sentence. Interrogative sentences are sentences, as the word indicates, contains a question. They are used for interrogation. How are you? Are you coming? These are examples of interrogative sentences. Interrogative sentences end with a question mark. The time for the class has come to an end. With that, uh, we have also covered the entire syllabus on the course, the structure of modern English. All the major aspects of this particular course are discussed in detail. For more information, as I told you, uh, you will be, uh, you have been advised to go to the audio video lessons already available on the YouTube channel. Some I have specified here in the course of the lesson. There are others that I have not specified. 